Welcome back to Keeping Ag Real. This is Jenny Schweiger. I'm a mom, wife, chauffeur, sheep and cattle herder, front porch obsessor, and your host. Welcome back to Keeping Ag Real. Today, I don't have necessarily a guest for you all. She is a repeat guest, but today she'll be more of a co-host. Please welcome Gracie Weinzerl. Hi, Gracie. Hi, how are you? I am great. Thanks for coming back on. We're going to be chatting about grocery stores. And what does that have in common with a project you're working on? Well, we're actually reading a book uh, called Grocery in Ag Book Club right now. So, And it's been very interesting. I guess there's a little bit of similarity there. So basically, it's taking a dive into grocery stores, which you wouldn't think would be cool, but it's actually really, really interesting. All about the history of them and like even down to the layout and why. So this is a book that the Ag Book Club is reading, and I'm reading as well, along with several others. Um, and then we meet up on Wednesday nights on Twitter and chat about the book and the assigned reading that we had from the week previous. What do you think your favorite part has been so far? The part that was talking about basically processed foods and how we choose to buy food. So there's a great analogy there, basically like how raw do you buy your food? I was talking about how grocery stores have basically almost become restaurants in a way. So rather than a place where you go to buy your commodity ingredients, you are buying specialized foods, but you're also buying prepared foods. You expect grocery store prices. I guess all of it went into that, like that's actually the loss leader at grocery stores stores is the prepared food section, which is just crazy to me because it's like, is that not the value added part? But I don't know. I don't know about you when you're shopping, but I'm like, oh yeah, I could totally make that. It's like, yeah, flour is only like a dollar or something. Yeah, I could totally do that. Yeah. Especially if you were to go to someplace like Aldi. I mean, you've got flour that's under $2. You've got sugar, brown sugar. Now, if you're going for like wheat-free or gluten-free flour, that is a bit more. It's like that ready-made or already cooked bacon. It's like it's just sitting there on the shelf. It's like, okay, yeah, we can't cook our own bacon now. Exactly. I wonder what that tastes like, actually. I have not tried it yet, so I don't know. I, I haven't tried it either, but I'm also that person that's like, well, I could get the uncooked for like half the price, but I'm going to do that. So why do you think that that's kind of the loss area at a grocery store? Prepared food? Yes. When I say prepared food, I'm talking like, you know, the grocery store bakery or like where they have the ready-made soups and things like that. And I think part of it is the staffing. You know, you have to pay people to make the food. It's also, you know, you go to the grocery store and you don't expect to pay like really high prices for something. Like you're not going to pay what you would pay at a restaurant for like a fried chicken dinner or something like that. If you go in a grocery store, you're expecting, you know, the basic price and you would think that it'd be cheaper because, well, yeah, they can buy the ingredients at home wholesale, Mm -hmm. but they're also thinking about things like, oh, it has to, the book made the comment, like it has to look good cold, which is weird. So it makes sense because they're like, oh yeah, people buy it and then they go home and warm it up. But too, it's like, why are you shopping for that food at a grocery store? But it makes sense. So are we talking about like a, the pizza store where you go in there and they make the pizza? It's uh, fresh in front of you, and then you take it home, and it's like a take and bake? Um, Kind of. Like, that would be one option of it, but that's probably already made. I'm thinking things like, you know how some grocery stores would have, like, a salad bar in the, I'm, like, one step up from Walmart. So I'm almost thinking, like, Hy-Vee. So you know how they have that mm-hmm. restaurant in the store, and then I haven't really shopped at Hy-Vee a lot, but they have all of these options for food. Like, you can basically get lunch there without going in the restaurant. My husband is actually working on a job site right now where they are moving the store it was very small with a restaurant and now they're trying to add two restaurants within a store it's going to be interesting to see how it how it turns out and i i wonder why do they want to have two restaurants in the same grocery store that's nuts I mean, like, are they trying to make themselves a destination, I wonder? That could be. I don't know. They talk about now you can go grocery shopping and you can, like, drink wine while you're grocery shopping. But then on the flip side, you've got, like, all these free grocery delivery services popping up everywhere. Where can you drink wine while you're shopping? I don't know, but I keep seeing it all over the Internet, and I want that. It's, I mean, it, it's genius. Think about all of these direct sale companies that have been around for, you know, decades, like... 
Mary Kay, Pampered Chef, all of those types of, a lot of times it's alcohol that's served and it's supposed to help relax everyone and hopefully increase the sales of the event. It's interesting to see that technique taken from something as small as a direct sale to a grocery store. Or, you know, they're also trying to appeal to working moms now. You know, it's not like the 50s where, you know, there was a stay-at-home mom there, a housewife, that was able to go out during the day do grocery shopping and the store was only open from like 10 to 6. You know, we've got 24-hour super centers now that you can go pick up that loaf of bread five minutes before you make put dinner on the table. So what do you think is the drawback. Why aren't we, I guess, consuming? Are you saying like the prepared foods? Right. They do a lot in terms of volume of product. It's just they're not priced to make money. Because you think about it, like you're not going to pay the same price at a restaurant that you would a grocery store. So what do you think the purpose is to have those types of prepared foods available? Is it to bring people in and then hopefully they're going to shop some more? I think it's to bring people in, but I think any more it's expected. You know, one person did it, and then all of a sudden every other store has to do it now because if they don't do it, they're going to go to a competitor. That's interesting. Yeah. But I think part of it has to do with location. So I live downtown St. Louis. There is a grocery store downtown St. Louis. It's like an IGA. doesn't have hardly anything. It's a little bit overpriced for my taste, but I swear like a third of the footprint of the store is like, the prepared food so you can get salad at the salad bar or you can get just wraps in the freezer or in the refrigerator section just ready to go or you can get warm foods like you know the fried chicken or burgers or other sandwiches and then there's a whole second floor that's just devoted to beer and wine you know being downtown st louis where there's a lot of millennial 20 somethings that that's what they're looking for so let me ask you this when i go to an ikea what's on the very top floor mm-hmm. it's the prepared foods well, Ikea is a little bit of a different experience, don't you think? Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's a completely different um, product base, I guess, product line. It's not a grocery store. But does that make it a destination store? Does that make it a destination experience? I mean, knowing that you can get your meal there, you should start with a meal. Yeah, that tells you that you should probably spend some time there, right? Right. Yeah, no, I'm with you. So I haven't come across that in the book yet about the destination experience stores. There's definitely all of these different techniques and approaches that stores are taking now. When you look at the fresh food delivery services from something like Amazon to HelloFresh to Blue Apron. I wonder what the percentage of people are actually utilizing those services versus going to the store. It's interesting. I'm also curious if like those meal kits that you can get, so it's like what, four or five dollars per serving. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they're actually making any money. If you think about it, they're all like, oh, here's a gourmet meal with fancy ingredients, and then they ship it to you. Well, shipping's not cheap, especially for a box that size. I'm curious. And especially when it's got to be packaged, just so if it's a perishable type of food. Right. And they're offering all kinds of, you know, like HelloFresh keeps offering me $30 off my first box. It's like, wow. Uh, so how expensive are these boxes? So, I don't know. I wrote a piece. It's been a while ago about how grocery stores such as Walmart and Kroger, Schnucks, they're going to become the assisted living um, facility of the future, if you will, (laughs) because our generations are going to, you know, stop going to the store to get their food. It's going to be all delivery based, all Amazon or HelloFresh or what have you. And I wrote the piece based off of session I had listened to from Mary Shellman, who's the former director of Harvard's Agribusiness School. And she had spoken at an event a year ago, and I at first completely disagreed with what they were saying. And then it was, oh, I don't know, two weeks later, Amazon announces the purchase of Whole Foods. It was like, wow, okay, maybe this is where we're going, and it's going fast, and it's going faster than what the the experts are predicting. I was going to say, to your point, and not to give you any spoilers on part five of the grocery book we're reading, but they talk about how the processed foods, so you think about like your Cheetos or your Ritz crackers, you know, those branded items that are the same no matter where you buy them. Mm-hmm. 
they're talking about like the Amazons of the world taking that over and it just becomes a commodity. You know, what happens to grocery stores? And it was interesting because the author made the point, it's like, well, grocery stores are just con- going to continue to diversify. Part of that, I think, is that experience. Like, what can you do while you're at the store? Where can you get that, you know, fancy fruit from you know, South America that we have never heard of. You know, so maybe those inner aisles they talk about are going to go away, but I, I still have yet to see Amazon be able to ship you milk. No, a gallon of 2% milk or a half gallon of chocolate milk. Folks around us, we don't even have access to Amazon Fresh's service. And most of those, you know, like HelloFresh and Blue Apron aren't available in our area yet. So there's... There's a, a divide there again between rural and urban and how the shipping and the availability is going to affect how we purchase our foods and where we purchase our foods. Think about it. Self-checkout, you don't even have to interact with anybody. Does that change that chain? And yesterday when I went shopping at Walmart, they have all these new carts at our quote-unquote local Walmart, and it's a mobile self-checkout. It wasn't quite up to running yet. They were just kind of in the preparation stages. So on one side, I could set my phone and there was actually like a holster so that the phone doesn't like fall out or anything. And then on the other side, there's a place for, I'm imagining it's a scanner gun. So you can scan your items on your own and then put it into the cart. And then you pay when you go and you turn that scanner back in. Interesting. What water is this? Uh, Pekin. Oh, so go check that out. So one thing I find interesting, and I, I think it's just of my grocery shopping habits, but growing up in a rural area, and you obviously live in a rural area, how often do you go grocery shopping? <laughs> so that's a funny question because it goes back to... That goes back to another topic. That is the blow up of Dollar Generals in rural America. You know, it just, it depends. It depends on if I have other things that I need to get done, like an oil change or um, let's say there's a, a feed that we would prefer to get in town rather than at our local feed mill or, you know, the kids need something for school or something like that that we can't find at Dollar General. Lately, I've been going to like a regular grocery store probably once every two weeks, which is is not ideal because Dollar General doesn't have the fresh fruit and vegetables that you find at a regular grocery store. And I'm finding also when I'm adding up for the budget each month, this is causing us to spend more money on grocery shopping because we just run into Dollar General and grab what we think we want. So a box of Ritz crackers could still be $2, the same price as what you could find at times at Walmart. But it's also significantly smaller amounts in that box. So I would be better off you know, driving 30 minutes or whatever shopping there realistically speaking, I'm a mom of three kids. I'm running around driving kids to different activities and places. And, you know, I may not always have my grocery list ready to go. And that is something that stops me from actually getting in the vehicle and going. If I don't have the grocery list ready, I'm always afraid I'm going to go to the store and I'm going to spend more money than what we need to spend because I wasn't prepared. So that's another, I guess, barrier to getting myself into town. Right. Well, and I'll, I'll just build on that. Like, you know, I grew up in a rural area, but I have lived in town since I started college. So it's been like seven or eight years now. I rarely go grocery shopping. Like, if I really need something, I'll walk over to the store downtown. But, it, like, any day, if like, if I'm out of something, I will wait until I'm out of everything to go grocery shopping. And then I'm going to go to Aldi's. Like, I will drive out of my way to go to Aldi's. So how do you eat? You just continue to use whatever you have in your pantry? Yeah. I'll just, oh, darn, I'm out of this. So I guess I won't be, you know, making anything that needs milk in it for another week, you know? What? What else can I plan? But I also, I just... 
I have things on hand. You know, I've got canned fruit. I've got canned beans. I've got SpaghettiOs for emergencies. I've got box of ramen in my cabinet. Like, <laughs> well, and you think about it too. I, if I make a meal, I can eat on it for like three or four meals at least because I live alone. True. How can you go a week without milk? I don't drink a ton of milk. I mean, and I've got some in the freezer, you know, because I can't stand to pour it down the drain if it's, you know, three days from going bad and then heading out of town. I've never done that before, but we're a family that goes f- through four to six gallons a week. I grew up in one of those families, too. Let's kind of move away from buying habits to local and what local means. So on that last episode that you were on, we talked about local food. When you go into our local Aldi's, we're in central Illinois, and you go to purchase a bag of potatoes, and you look up and look for the price, and underneath the price is locally grown. So then, of course, I'm like, what? And I look at the bag, and they're grown in Michigan, and that that's just one example of several different products that they're selling where they have the locally grown above the item. Do you experience that down in the St. Louis area? We'll talk about it a lot during, you know, the summer months. So I'll go, we have a farmer's market that I'll go to every once in a while. It just, you know, for the experience mostly, but they'll talk about, oh, locally grown, buying ripened tomatoes. It's like, yeah, that's not really local, but okay, you know? And there's also a lot of peaches grown in southern Illinois, which I guess isn't too far from where I'm at. And they'll talk about, oh, locally grown peaches at, you know, XYZ Farm. It's like, cool, that that actually does feel local. You know, you're telling me where it's from and that it's a seasonal item. But I don't know, it's some things I feel like they over-advertise local. Way back when our kids were younger, we did some farmer's markets just to kind of help teach them the value of money and how to make money in the process and everything. And something that I found very interesting and disturbing was the number of people who were selling products at the farmer's market that were not from their farm or garden or what have you. So you've got people who drive to southern Illinois or west central Illinois. They pick up the peaches. Calhoun County peaches are amazing. If you ever get a chance, that's up kind of by Alton. So they go in, they get those peaches, they bring them up here And on Saturday morning, they go and they sell those. It doesn't necessarily have a sign on it as to where they came from, but the perceived notion of those people who are purchasing the food is that this person grew this this peach, so it must be good. Did you do you know or did you realize that some of that goes on in the background? Oh yeah, I absolutely see it because you know, how do you have these foods available in February? So I'll talk about oh, you know, locally grown in Arkansas, which I guess Arkansas is a lot closer to Missouri than it is to Illinois. But you know, and just just for the size of that market, specifically the one I've gone to, it's like yeah, it's definitely like you know, almost a grocery store reject sometimes. No, because you can get a great deal on spotted tomatoes. And I'll make some salsa. Wish I had a canner here. <laughs> You know, but I I do see that, you know, the farmer's market, it's usually a family there or a bunch of people and you see them every week if you go every week and you form that relationship with them, you know, or it's people selling handmade items. So there's this lady that makes beignets now and they are delicious and they will fry them right in front of you. And so you're getting that experience like, oh, you're making this for me right here and I can see it and you're telling me about it and you're telling me about your heritage. I need to come to St. Louis and come to a farmer's market there. That sounds much different than what we have here. It's a really, really big farmer's market. So what you're saying is farmer's markets are the destination experience and some different and different selling techniques to get the business. Definitely. And if you want to talk about drinking wine while you're shopping, they will sell you Bloody Marys while you're shopping at this farmer's market. Really? Yeah, I think there's two different stations that do that. So, but this is like this is a historic farmers market. So it's like Soulard, St. Louis area. So it's like one of the first buildings that went up, I guess. And it is huge, and it's been going for more than 200 years. They've got like a meat shop in there, and a spice shop in there. Like they have everything. And you're saying in there. So is it inside a building? 
kind of. So there's like an inside building and then there's like four legs to the building. So you might think of like the Illinois State Fairgrounds a little bit, just like the old brick structures. Mm, okay. And some of them are open, you know, like the show barns sometimes are. Mm-hmm. Like a pole it's barn. kind of like that. Yeah. So it's under shelter. There's a small interior area. Definitely old. But, you know, it's a destination. And when it was built, it it was built as this is where you come to the market, you know, and you, you get to know your vendors. So it's kind of always had that vibe until grocery stores came around. How long during the year, calendar year, is it open? They're open, I think, every week of the year. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, they may close around Christmas, but they're open five days a week. So where are they getting their produce and the items that they're selling? So like I was saying, there's like a flower shop in there. There's a spice shop in there. There's like a butcher shop in there. They sell meat. I think a lot of the produce probably comes from the south, you know, when it's starting to grow. Or I don't know if some people have greenhouses within a reasonable driving distance of St. Louis. I know some stuff will come from like grocery store so it's like think about it like the produce that's maybe starting to get a little bit past its prime but still has several good days left in it you know that a grocery store may not mm-hmm. take because they don't know that they can sell it right away and you don't want to buy a smushy apple sure. or an apple that looks bruised and so they'll sell it at the market because you still get something for it and people go to the market for a deal. So I, I do know during the summer that it is a lot of locally grown produce because people will be like, oh, you know, we're here from our farm. You only see them seasonally. You know, they'll drive an hour to come in. Even though it's open during the winter, it's not nearly as many vendors as it is during the summer months when you would expect this produce to be around. Okay, so I'm like, I guess dreaming and envisioning what this place is like (laughs) so is there like music and building an atmosphere that people want to be at absolutely so is it like live music yeah there's usually a guy outside with like a saxophone or something or whatever instrument he has that day you know playing for tips obviously but it's a little bit crowded for my taste you know definitely a destination atmosphere like you want to go there on a saturday morning in the summer I want to get there early before it gets hot. Sure. I mean, I kind of think about it. It's almost like the fair. You know, you have all those vendors, there's music, there's something to do while you're there. You can get a drink and you can kind of enjoy yourself as you look around. It's very interesting to hear about that and now wonder how many cities have the same type of draw to them. I mean, you always see the little shops like on a corner or something that you can, you know, drive in grab a couple things and drive out. But nothing quite as massive as what you're talking about. I guess in Peoria, Illinois, they do have one on Saturday mornings, I believe. Again, though, I don't think it's as large as what you are describing. Yeah, this one is definitely huge. I remember when I was in college, I went, I just happened to be uptown and they had like a farmer's market Tuesday or something like, you know, the most random day of the week to have a farmer's market. But it was like three of those canopy tent things. And it's like, this isn't really a good deal on green beans. You're still charging like three or four dollars a pound. Like I could totally grow those. So that was my next question is, what do you think about the price comparison between a market like that and going to the grocery store? And let me rephrase that. A market like that versus going to a regular grocery store versus Aldi's. I think you need to know what price you're willing to pay for something. So you think about foods that are typically seasonal. So say like red raspberries, you're going to get the best price in the spring and the summer. You're not going to find them in December for a very good price. Right. Honestly, like for me shopping, I have price points at what I will pay for something. So I'm not going to pay more than, you know, it it breaks my heart to try to pay more than $1.50 a pound for say Roma tomatoes, because I know when I eat them seasonally, I can get them for, you know, sometimes 40 cents a pound or less or, you know, free from my parents. <laughs> <laughs> but I think too, I look at sales and I will plan a shopping trip around a really good sale at a grocery store. I will play in two weeks worth of meals based off that sale if I have to, if it's that good. I guess it's like the biggest thing is you have to know what you're looking for and you have to know whether or not you're buying it seasonally to be able to get the best price. And it, it really comes down to choice. Like, yeah, I have a craving for blueberries 
I'm going to go out and buy some blueberries. I don't care how much they cost me. If they're available, I'm going to buy them. I guess one more thing I would want to add to that is know what you're going to use that produce for. I never go to, it's like the grocery store. I never go to the market without a shopping list of sorts. You know, like if I see a really good sale, I may rethink that. But like, hey, I have a bunch of tortilla chips laying around my kitchen. I should go get stuff to make salsa. It's like I have the onions and I have the green peppers. I just need some tomatoes. Mm-hmm. And so I'll look sometimes on the ground. I'll have like a big box of Roma tomatoes that are like spotted or slightly squishy. And usually, you know, like two or three of them are actually bad. And the rest like, oh, no, that's fine. That's what I would expect out of my garden anyway. Wouldn't buy that at a grocery store. But yeah, why not? Five bucks for like, you know, 20 pounds of tomatoes. Do I need 20 pounds of tomatoes? No. Five dollars? Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'll buy them. I'll find homes for them. That's interesting. You can't get those kinds of deals at the grocery store either. I mean, and that kind of goes in the food waste problem. Like, what happens when something is old but past its prime and you can't sell it for four full price at the grocery store? Mm-hmm. I mean, how often do you see discounted brown spotted bananas? You don't. Right. When I was out in California a few months ago, I was visiting a citrus processing company where they were processing oranges, grapefruit, lemons, avocados. And it was interesting to see how they divided them all up and then higher quality would then be sold to different retailers and at a higher price point than some of these others. But then you had your rejects and the the total rejects, and I'm thinking grapefruit specifically, that was all, I don't know if it was given or sold to a local rancher who then fed the grapefruit rejects to his cattle. What constituted a reject? I'm curious. It's extremely interesting to see the technologies that they're using at that level of the food industry. They will look at criteria as such as size, um, whether or not they've got browning or spots, bruises. This particular company, they installed computerized infrared that can measure the sweetness of an orange. So you know on the computer screen how sweet that orange is and whether it should be a reject or should it go in... You know, if you've got four buckets, does it go in the the lower bucket that gets sold at a lower price point or does it go in the higher bucket, which is sold to certain higher level retailers at a higher price point? A lot of your brown or the ones that had bruises, those were the ones that we saw them putting into this great big pile of grapefruit. So it's it's it was it was much more the outward appearance of the fruit that went to the cattle. That's interesting that they can measure the sweetness. Mm -hmm. We keep hearing from people that agriculture is the last frontier for technology. Based on my own experience and where I have been able to go and tour, that is not what I am seeing. Maybe I'm seeing rarities and situations that aren't typical. But I am seeing that technology. I know it exists. It's not something that's being developed. It has been developed. It's there. So I don't understand Mm -hmm. where, I guess, the disconnect is and where people are getting their information, which is kind of the whole point of all of, you know, keeping ag real is making sure that people understand what is really happening out there. And I can tell you this technology exists and it's being used also. Yeah, I keep thinking about how cool that is. But, you know, you go back to the food waste part, which, you know, what percent roughly would you guesstimate was going into that pile that was sold to the rancher? Oh, gosh. I would have to go back and look at my note. I don't remember. Probably like 20 or 30 percent at least. Possibly. And I think it depends on the grower. So you've got different levels of growers as far as the level of quality that they're putting into how they're growing their product. So we're hashing all of this out, but I feel like, you know, we're not necessarily taking this conversation anywhere except for letting listeners know from our experiences, what would be something that we could challenge listeners to do that would motivate them to find out more about their food? I would say... Well, next time they go to a grocery store, 
you know, you typically buy the same thing, but take a look around that product you typically buy. How many other things that are, are there on that shelf that are identical? So you, we talked about Oreos at some point. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to buy the reduced fat Oreos because that's what I always buy. Take a step back and look at all of the different products that are there of Oreos, like all the different flavors you can get, all the different knockoff brands of Oreos you can get. Why is it you buy that one? Or go to a different aisle of the store that you've never been in. You know, what's there? Why have you never visited that aisle? Why is this store your favorite store? I just, I would say like, call to action is like, why are you still choosing the experience of the grocery store over all of the other options we have now? You can buy prepared food and not even have to deal with the grocery store anymore. You can order takeout. You can order those meal services. You can order off Amazon. You can drive up to Walmart and they'll put it in their in your car for you. I was thinking to challenge listeners to, when they're at the store, you know, take out the different containers of milk or juice from the soy, the almond, cashew, and just look at the, the ingredients. Don't look at any of the advertising labeling, but look at the ingredient labeling and really understand what it is that goes into that. I like that. So we're not afraid of big words, right? You know? Right. You have like dextrose and something. That's fine. If you don't know what it is, go look it up. So here's another example. Just for the heck of it, I decided I was going to take the gluten-free taco seasoning made by McCormick. I believe it was McCormick. And I was going to take it a couple aisles down. And I was going to compare it to the, you know, regular, it has gluten supposedly in it, what have you. I turn both packages around and I look at the ingredients and the ingredients are exactly the same. You turn the package back over to the front and the one says gluten-free. The gluten-free was almost 50% more than the other package of seasoning because it had gluten-free on the package. So another challenge would be if you're shopping for something with a label that's making your food safer or healthier, I challenge you to go and find that exact same food without those labels and look at the back and see if there is a difference or not. Because the difference that you're paying for could just be in the labeling that's on that package. So those would be my my challenges to the listeners. Bingo. I like it. We are out of time, but this is going to become a reoccurring segment on keeping ag real, and we want to keep this conversation going. So next time, what I'm hoping is that we can find a clear definition of what local means. I want to address that area. What are some areas you want to address? I would be all over talking about food fat. Not necessarily labels, but why do we think one thing is more nutritious for us one year, but then three years down the road, it's the opposite. Okay. Well, we will do some research and come back with some more information and discussion on the term local and what that means, as well as some of the different food fads that we've now had the historical experience. We can go back and we can look and see where it started, why it started, and what research has been found since then and what maybe has changed in quote-unquote fat. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Jenny. Thank you. And again, everyone can attend the Ag Book Club, which is on Wednesday nights on Twitter at 8 p.m. Anything else you want to throw out there about the book club? We're starting a brand new book on February 7th, so that would be the perfect time to jump on in. And people can go to agbookclub.com. Is that right? Yep. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks again for tuning in for another episode of Keeping Ag Real. You can go to the website, keepingagreal.com. Not only are there podcasts available, there's also blogs, and there are vlogs, which are slowly coming out as well. So this is going to be a multimedia effort, finding more information out about your food and agriculture. You can follow me on Twitter, either at Keeping Ag Real or at Jen Schweigert. You can also find the Keeping Ag Real page on Facebook. Until next time, keep it real.